She'll get going. Good, mor good morning, everybody. Uh, let's uh, get going. You've been good enough to turn up at 9 o'clock. Um, always extraordinary the speed at which uh, a fabulous party can be replaced by tables. And all of you, having been here, most of you were here last night, and that extraordinary uh, giraffe um, reminding me of Warhorse, the extraordinary play uh, in London. I'm sure some of you will have seen it, but Warhorse, and of course, the uh, uh, the representation of uh, animals um, being moved around by human beings. Anyway, what we've got is um, a very tight schedule, but a lot to do. And um, uh, it is very much a working session, so it's not something where you can coast through it. Uh, this is picking up from where we left off uh, on Wednesday, but so much has happened uh, on the principles uh, of rethink, um, redesign, and rebuild. And this is about trying to define within the next hour and a half uh, what the takeoff uh, and takeaway messages are. We've got some kind of system to make this happen, um, which is designed to grab um, the, the ideas from those groups that you've been involved in for the Global Redesign Initiative um, and the Global Agenda Councils as well. Uh, so we need to find tangible lines to pursue by 10.30. Much of this will be, of course, in the final report as well. Um, the clusters you're in are based on the sub-themes uh, of the annual meeting, uh, which uh, will have meant that many of you have either been moderating or uh, leaders in the discussions throughout the last four days. And what we've got to do is grab the main concepts that you have identified in these six areas um, which have been the focus uh, of this annual meeting. And my job, frankly, is to make sure uh, that there's some kind of order to the next um, uh, hour and 25 minutes. Now, um, we want you to shape the report. We want you to uh, think of the takeaways in your area, the kind of things you'll mention when you get back to the office or with your family or whatever. It's that kind of um, uh, core sense of what you've achieved uh, in the areas that you have been um, uh, involved in. And the way we're going to do this, and let's put up uh, the, the next, uh, the timing of this. Again, it's imperfect, but it's a way of grabbing uh, the spirit of what you have said, what you've decided. In the first 35 minutes, we want you to create, not words, but three phrases three phrases, imagine it's Twitter, three phrases, maybe 140 characters uh, that summarize the key insights and recommendation uh, for your table's theme. And what we're going to do, um, we're going to post up uh, each of those phrases as, as you um, decide upon them. They will appear Twitter style on, on the screen, which again, hopefully, will stimulate other tables and other um, uh, groups to think, actually, we should be going down that track as well. You've got 35 minutes. Please don't leave it all to the end of the 35 minutes. Post it as soon as you can through the, um, uh, through the forum's representative on the, on the table who is using the computer. And then after that, we are going to synthesize together. There'll be a short break, and uh, I've asked Mark Malik brown to come up and, and give his sense of where the last four days have gone. And we're then going to post and, and get into a very, very fast-moving uh, I want it to be anyway, uh, we want to grasp as well, in, in a soundbite way, sound way the, 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 the way in which you have identified those phrases. And then at the end, uh, two or three rapporteurs to bring together the impressions from these phrases so that by 10.31 we should have an absolute clarity. Now, I hope I've been clear. Does anyone want to ask any questions? Good, that means you have clarity. Um, you're confused. I'm sorry? Rather confused. Well, it's up to the table to clarify it for you. That's why you have other experts at the table. So take a stiff coffee 
and uh, just relax, and um, I'm sure it'll come together. Michael, alongside you, will make sure. So, um, can I encourage you to move ahead now for the next 35 minutes? It is about focusing on the values and the themes that have come out of your particular areas. That's why you're here, why you've got out of bed early, to be here, to keep that process going, uh, which is before Davos, through Davos, and now beyond Davos as well, um, within the spirit of what that, um, uh, that quote from President Sarkozy. So let me say that uh, we want to go down this track now for the next 35 minutes. Up to you. Freedom of speech, 
Making awareness of together and it works reasonably well, but it's a patchwork. But, but yeah, the design the system yeah. is designed much better. It's, I mean, it's true that, that the rulemaking process in civil aviation does constrain, to some extent, the pace of innovation, and that's always frustrating. But yet, civil aviation has become much more effective, it's become a much more dense system, and it's gotten much more
I'd like to just tell you, you've been working for 15 minutes. We're beginning to get the first posts up there. So can I encourage you now to commit up to three phrases onto the laptop, please, uh, in the next 10 or 15 minutes? Okay. 
of legitimacy in terms of the first part, yeah. are you engage or involve people, and efficiency at the second stage. And, and the point that Annie was making before is absolutely key, that is, we've seen so many institutions which seem to be about institutions. The only thing we can talk about is how they are functioning in terms of these these institutions are not about people, they're not legitimate in the way we If we can find a way to phrase the fact that it's a solution that the Republic has to have, it's a good thing. These institutions are about institutions and not about people.
Ladies and gentlemen, can I encourage you to make up a final decision within the next two minutes? You don't have to produce three phrases on each table, but could you begin to close down your discussions and then we'll move forward to capture the spirit of these six themes.
Does anyone desperately need more time? Speak now, otherwise we'll move on. You really need two minutes. I'll give you two more minutes, but no more. Well, you can have one phrase if you want. The main... Okay. Yes, indeed. Okay. Right. Uh, a lot of you are looking up at the the feed on the on the um, uh, on the screen. It's a very rich field that we've created of a lot of ideas. We've got about 50 minutes in which we've now got to push it forward and find out where um, the uh, the areas come together, what more work needs to be done. This is going to be a very much a soundbite conversation. What we're doing at the moment is we are pulling together the different groups and the different phrases so that we've got a slate for each of the six groups. It's, it's um, quite time uh, sensitive to get this done very quickly. But while we're doing that, Mark Malik brown can you just um, reflect on this process and where we've got to in the last four days? Well, look, thank you. And I see this phrase, big takeaways, and one's constantly reminded in Davos that there's always going to be somebody who's going to rebel against that. So I have Gareth Evans at our table who said the only takeaway he knows is pizza. Um, and, you know, I do think that, you know, always the struggle at a moment like this is between, uh, towards the end of a meeting of the forum, is this gap between the powerful 30,000 feet uh, compelling vision of the world which says the current institutions aren't working, the current systems are not managing uh, change between countries and within countries in an effective mm -hmm. enough way. And then we say, well, what's the answer to that critique? And that's where traditionally Davos has struggled and where the Global Redesign Initiative, which we've all been working on over the last few days, with, which is incorporated in the title of the meeting this year, is to, in a sense, challenge us to go that next stage, to not leave the mountain with our tail between our legs, having confirmed again that the world doesn't work as well as we aspire to have it work, but to go away knowing we've begun to move some things forward which will change things. And here you have to come down as a group like us from 30,000 feet to something like 100 feet or maybe one foot above ground because what I think has been so rich coming out of these global agenda councils is not the very big ideas 
but the smaller doable ideas, the actionable ideas which draw on the kind of multi-stakeholder character of this forum, which allows government uh, and business and civil society leaders to combine around ideas which often the academics in the room uh, have let loose as hairs, uh, to really see if we can make change. And I think coming through not just the, this session today and the, the, the GAC streamed to the uh, work over the last four days, but in session after session, there's been a huge emphasis on the practical next step ideas. And that's you know, what we want to capture coming out of this. We've, it's a process that began in Dubai and before, and will go on to this meeting with governments in Qatar, where we hope we can present both a powerful, compelling 30,000 foot critique, which draws on its power just because of who the collectivity of this forum is, that we have all kinds of leaders represented here, but doesn't stop at that critique, but says, here are things we can start to do together with governments to make the change. And you know, if we can do that, it really, I think, adds a whole new dimension to the Davos experience. We go away not having just networked and, 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 and heard some wonderful ideas, but knowing there's follow-up. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Uh, we've, got 40... <laughs> we've got 45 minutes. I think the time will go in this way. In about 35 minutes, I want to get round all the six areas, starting with values, then on to sustainability, then economic and social welfare, then global risks and systemic failures, and uh, security. Now, what we've done is we've captured the Twitters, or whatever we want to call them, up here on one slate. I'd invite those of you who've been addressing values, it's hard for me uh, to ask you to do this immediately, but to reflect on some of these um, which uh, have gone up in the last uh, half an hour and why they're so important and others can contribute as well. I know it's a lot to take in, but we've got to move it quite quickly. Who from the values tables would like to add something about the importance of what you posted up here. Yeah, Matthew Bishop with The Economist and the uh, chair of the Philanthropy and Social Investing Council. Um, change what we measure uh, was something that we put forward. And you know, our sense is that we are really focusing, we have been uh, focusing on measuring the wrong things and so as a result uh, of that we've ended up with the problems that we are dealing with today and that we need a real crusade to uh, identify what it is what, what the goals of society are and what that we want to live in and what measurement systems are going to be able to uh, point us in the right direction, show us whether we're heading in the right direction and so um, you know that I think is one of the discussions that's come up time and time again in our, in the, in our tables, uh, interactions this week. So um, I, the phrase uh, statistics uh, really came out of uh, the science of the state and uh, Enrico Giovannini, the statistician, was saying that he now uses the phrase uh, sociistics uh, for the uh, science of society and I think maybe we need that, that to take off. What about brave and enlightened moral leaders building on the Facebook poll before this about ethics and values? Who would like to come in, please? I'm going to set a six-minute deadline for each area, but please, if you weren't on the table, please jump in as well. Let's make this a soundbite contribution. Malika Sarabai, the first three phases came out of this table, and I think we feel very strongly that we can go away from each Davos pontificating. But if each of us here makes a personal commitment to be some of these things, to, to actually be the brave leader, to be the moral leader, to be the courageous leader. And even if just the people in this room make that commitment seriously to themselves, then we will have really started an avalanche of change. Anyone else on values? Please, at the back. Get your hands up quickly, then we can get the microphone to you. Uh, here, please, as well. Simon Maxwell, this is a great list, but forgive me saying so, it's a values-free list. And what I would love us to be able to say out of this session is nobody gets left behind in this world. Nobody suffers from malnutrition. Nobody is unprotected in disasters. The core values are about the people. 
and about the way in which we are together, and I feel that doesn't quite come out. I think it may come out in one or two others, Simon, having seen some of the, those that have gone through. And I should say that Simon, David Kennedy and Ashraf Ghani are going to try and bring to get this together at an uber super level at the end before we adjourn at 10.30, please. Yeah, one other one we could... Sorry, Stuart Wallace and the New Economics Foundation. One other one that we came up with was the critical need to actually change decision-making systems from short-term, very often very self-interested, to longer-term, enlightened, and we talked about a moral economy as well. And that can be very practical things like not allowing people to vote stock unless they've held it for two years, and things like that which business leaders and others have been talking about. So we critically need to focus on both the moral principles that should underlie our economy and the decision-making systems and how we move them from short-term to long-term. Who's got the microphone? Who else has the microphone, please? Thank you. My name is Mpo Magwana from South Africa. Um, I want to echo the point uh, that was made earlier. We had said at our table that uh, leadership is impossible without moral authority. And really, in this century, we need among the, the young and emerging leaders, we need 40-something, 50-year-olds with the moral grounding of a Gandhi, the moral grounding of a Mandela. We need to become the change that we wish to see happen in this century. So we need to become the values, the moral authority. Thank you. Please. Yes, uh, following on, on the importance of, uh, of bringing uh, the ethics to action. Uh, as a philosopher, I, I would say that uh, we should stop listening to what people say are their values. There's a theory that we should look at the world through as if uh, the eyes of a deaf person looking at what people are actually doing. And the actions reveal the people's real character. So uh, uh, the thought is to go to that action level showing our uh, uh, real ethics and one additional thing from Jody Williams who led the campaign on uh, banning landmine was bringing in the actual witnesses of suffering uh, within our discussions because then you get emotion in the mood and if without emotion there's no motion in new directions in ethics. Thank you. One behind you. Then we'll move yeah. on to sustainability. Uh, Dermot Martin and the Archbishop of Dublin. Uh, um, we are what we allow to happen. Uh, many things have been going on which happened, we, they were allowed to happen, either because we closed our eyes to them or because we didn't have the insight to see the consequences of what was going on. And the answer to that is to everybody, don't abdicate on your responsibility and don't just leave it to uh, systems. Systems won't change unless people change and accept the responsibility. Right. Um, it's a regret that I've got to keep moving it along, but that's the time we have. Let's move on to sustainability, um, which is the second slide. Again, uh, pulling together all of your feeds in the last uh, 50 minutes. A defining moment for society, leverage waste as a resource, and empower. I have to say I've seen that word empower come up an enormous number of times in a lot of these contributions. Who from the sustainability groups would like to, particularly some of the leaders? <laughs> Please, just get a microphone. Uh, Tim. So, uh, <clears throat> for, for, from, certainly from this, this table, uh, this idea of uh, in, in, informing and inspiring consumers to make better decisions seems to be still a major gulf in terms of the kind of understanding at this level of the need for change and the understanding at the broad societal level of what that change is all about. And so a tremendous focus on, uh, on informing and ultimately inspiring consumers is going to be necessary. And empowering? Ultimately, uh, therefore, empowering. But without information, that empowering is not going to happen. Pavan Sukhdev from the Biodiversity. Keep going. It's fine, keep going. Biodiversity um, Council. And, same time. Um, uh, the third one on the empowerment of collective will and basically as a means of addressing the root causes was our sort of compilation collectively. It's about making natural capital economically visible 
Uh, that is a root cause of most of our issues with uh, losing the global commons. We want to reduce perverse subsidies. I think fisheries and oceans are a classic example, but not just that, also agricultural subsidies and fossil fuel subsidies. We want to reduce resource inefficiencies. Agriculture is an area where almost 50% of production is lost, either at the field or in the process or in waste bins. And lastly, and most importantly, we want to protect the commons, the atmosphere, the oceans and the forests. So that's where our thinking came from in terms of the collective will to do all of the above. And the first one is ours too, which is about who are we and where are we? I mean, th this is a defining moment for society. And we have to understand basics. Ecology is about caring. Equity is about sharing. Sustainability is economy. Without that, there is none. Truth eliminates and denial exacerbates. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Please. Could I ask whoever, uh, whichever table uh, came up with inequality is the enemy of sustainability to just elaborate a bit on that? Can I elaborate on why inequality is the enemy of sustainability? Excellent. Colin Brown. Uh, and I think we were very conscious here of the difference between developing and developed economies. And sustainability doesn't mean the same thing uh, to everybody. And when we said inequality is the enemy, it's the fact that when I'm in a particular situation, I will view it in a particular way. But if I'm desperately short of needs, I've got high poverty, uh, uh, high disease, then I have a different view of sustainability to somebody in a very comfortable environment. Any others, please? Or others who are not on the tables or involved in that theme? Who, please, yes. Who's got the hand up? Just get the microphone if you put your hand up because then we save time. Um. Julia King from the, uh, the Global Agenda Council on the Future of Transportation. Uh, I'm very conscious that uh, in transportation, in order to provide uh, low carbon transportation, we're looking at lots of new technology. And as we look at lots of new technology, as we look at a world where we might move from 850 million cars to several billion cars, we will be generating enormous amounts of additional waste. And this issue of closed loop processes of waste having a huge value, of waste becoming a resource, of perhaps waste becoming something you tax rather than profits. We've got to change the thinking to make sure that all these new things we need to use less energy don't actually become the destruction in themselves. So waste as a resource was something we were all very passionate about. <laughs> what about empowering consumers, second from the end, empower consumers to make better decisions. Anyone want to add something on that? Please. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> At our table, we, um, uh, similar to this table, believe that um, information given to consumers is going to be the uh, driving force of change here. And one of the things in particular is the role of uh, retailers and manufacturers. Uh, Best Buy was mentioned. We also have Walmart and Tesco making strong initiatives in the area of carbon footprint uh, labeling uh, to force and pressure manufacturers into uh, providing that information at the point of sale that will enable consumers and their kids at home uh, to force better decision making in this area. Thanks. You're using that word force, of course. There's no time not to force at Thank this you. stage. Uh, Peter Anderson from the Chronic Diseases Council. I think it's not just about informing and inspiring, but also helping. There are many things that we can do to nudge people into making better choices uh, that go across all of these areas, sustainability, chronic diseases, or whatever. Uh, Aaron Kramer from the uh, GAC on sustainable consumption. And I think in, in talking about inspiring consumers, we have to make this about better quality of life. If we paint this as doing with less uh, in not enabling the development uh, of our economy that enables people, particularly in emerging economies, to improve their lives, we won't get anywhere. So this has to be a positive story. We haven't yet figured that out, and we need to do that. Anyone else quickly? Thanks for being so sharp and brief on this, but these are very important points. Anyone? Because we can move on to uh, economic and social welfare. There are these themes emerging. Yes, please, one, one more hand's gone up there. Uh, David Kenny from Marketing and Branding, having been through this all week, I encourage us to take the word consumer completely out of this conversation. The problem is consumption is not good for sustainability. I, I think in the end we have to be innovative about encouraging people to share. Um, uh, there's a lot more resource to go around when people share, when people carpool, when people borrow, when they don't waste but they pass it along. 
And I, I, I'm really grappling with how to, how to innovate business models that are not based on consumers, but are based on people who share. What is the word we should use instead of consumers? People. Thank you. Right, let's move on. Uh, we've got four more groups, but I know one group has only put up post, posted one uh, idea. So uh, let's move on to um, economics, please, and social welfare. This will take a little bit of time to read. Who from uh, one of the economic groups would like to please yes. um, clarify and add to several of these uh, thoughts, please? Thank you. Kunio Mikuria from World Custom Organization. Um, this table has started with a recognition that the challenge ahead is bigger than last year uh, with more uncertainty. And there are emerging contradictions between global interest and the national political reality. And then there is a shift of power uh, geographically. And to deal with that, but who suffer the most is the poor. So this is why we come up with the idea that poverty alleviation through employment creation should be an international priority. And at the same time, uh, we discussed that there is uh, this, to deal with this risk of fragmentation, we need to have uh, act as a global community and to reallocate our human resources, the alignment, uh, perhaps migration is one issue, and uh, in the end what we need is global coordination. And at the same time, we have to get across our message and uh, education at each level uh, is very important. So this... Thank you very much. Any other thoughts from uh, these groups, these tables? I'd like to point you particularly, it's about halfway down, the imbalances through globally coordinated reforms. Could we um, expand on that? And also, the specific recommendation of financial institutions paying for insurance equal to risk-adjusted support requirements. Could someone explain what that means? You can't all have been talking about it and not want to explain it now. Please. The idea is, of course, uh, Which idea are you talking about? About the risk-adjusted support requirements, okay. which should uh, be financed by industry itself. That's actually something that uh, an industry representative brought up uh, himself. And for economists, it seems self-evident. If a group, if an industry creates trouble for the economy, <laughs> you should ask them to put some money aside so that they can actually be held liable for the <coughs> damage they cause. Is it achievable? It is achievable because, you see, partially industry is, uh, is agreed on it and governments are actually working behind the scenes on different ways to implement that and uh, it could come out uh, very soon. How soon? Mm, within the next year you could have a concrete uh, project and then it has to be agreed. We come back to the previous point at the global level and if everybody pays, then there's no question about competitiveness of the industry, one country against the other and uh, then it should be able to work. Anyone want to pick up on that? And also the issue of uh, globally coordinated reforms, how that, how that can be achieved, please. Microphone is on its way. Okay. Um, we've tried to coordinate the aid and support for countries by having meetings and more meetings and more meetings and we spend a lot of time trying to coordinate and to organize some, some kind of global planning. And we say give up that and, and rely on collaborative networks that self-organize. There are many more players now. There are private donors. There are social entrepreneurs. There, there are corporate social responsibility. There's too many players to fit in sort of like a ni nicely organized UN system. And what we need is to move to that, to, to embrace that complexity and facilitate the formation of, of these networks and work on making a interaction less costly. Collaborative networks that self-organize, is that achievable? I think, I think it would, it's already happening, but instead of hiding it under the rug, 
we should work to make it more efficient. How does it get catalyzed? I think that, for example, if you think that uh, the market it works better if you adopt some rules that, that uh, you know, like money or whatever, it, it, property right things that uh, allow people to, to work better. Here, the problem is that, you know, countries are, uh, when they work with different people, uh, they have different patterns of accountability uh, and, and, and reporting and auditing and procurement. And so all of these things comp complexify the process unnecessarily. So we should agree on uh, norms of behavior that facilitate that interaction, but not try to plan that, uh, what that interaction is for. Okay, zoom in. Yeah. Thank you, Nick. And uh, actually, this uh, line from uh, our table at the 13th, and uh, uh, we feel the mood in Davos this year is a lot of uncertainty around, and uh, we feel and we are facing more challenges this year than the year uh, uh, 2009. There's a potential risk for crisis for public uh, uh, solvency debts. There's a uh, uh, financial uh, regulatory framework picture is not all clear uh, yet, and jobs still maintain a major challenge for, for, for many countries, and the global unbalancing has been improved a little bit, but still uh, deep structure issues. And the, the fact is, today, the business is so global but the, polit uh, the political decision is all make the local. How do we balance the authority between the local and the global? It's obvious it's a big challenge we're facing today. The all the issue we mentioned, so this table discussed, all the global issues. So we we'll encourage global leaders to pay more attention on global coordination in the common years. The risk is we hear what the President Obama, the proposal on financial sector reform, which is out of blue immediately, we hear what the President Sarkozy did the speech here, and which is actually not in line with, with G20 spirits. So we think it's absolutely important for this year for all the global leaders to push the global coordination. What about though, these, co these coordinated networks? Could that achieve more than the political leaderships? What we, we heard about earlier. Um, here what? The, the idea of um, these other networks, which could achieve much more than maybe governments. Well, this is uh, all different aspects. I think we can work together, though. Okay. But right. that's the issue we need to pay attention. Thanks. Uh, Richard Blurt from Halpage. I, I mean, I sense that there is a momentum uh, coming out of Davos, recognizing the need for greater equity. Um, one can see the countries that have been able to protect their citizens through the crisis. Brazil, South Africa, Bolivia, many of the OECD countries have good social security systems. How are we going to create a momentum uh, in the next few years to improve social security? Um, China is looking, for instance, at creating a universal citizen's pension by 2010, 2020. That's a great momentum. Without that, you're not going to create the conditions in which you're going to be tackling inequality. All right. I have to be very brutal. Please keep your remarks as short as you can because time is marching on and a lot of people want to speak. Enrico Giovannini uh, from Italian Statistical Office. Just to say that politicians want to make reforms but to be re-elected. So the problem is that uh, leaders will not be re-elected because something good is happening in another country. So I think that the networks that you are talking about can push everyone towards the same objectives. That is something that came in one of our discussions on this global um, engagement of people in order to push in that direction. We're moving on to global risks and systemic failure shortly. I can see you over there. So uh, just keep your remarks to economic and social welfare, please. Two points from our table. One was we should not look at financial markets in isolation. We should think about other areas like transportation, civil aviation, or the internet, and think systemically about the, the ways in which we make progress on local regulation versus international cooperation, and think about what we can learn as we look across the domains. The other point which has not come up yet, which we emphasized in our eliminate poverty through education, global engagement, everybody gets those. Security is extraordinarily important if you think about the bottom billion. And this isn't just states where there's conflict, but this is place, these are places where children are kidnapped, women are raped, uh, and can't work jobs because of those kinds of threats to personal security. 
So to respond to Mark's question about on the ground, we should commit not only to pressuring every government to make sure that it provides that kind of security for its citizens, but we should also commit that if a government can't, we'll give people places where they can move, where they can have it. Thank you. Here and over there, and then I'm just going to move on, please. Oh, yes. People are taking many things away from what happened at Davos. Our concern is what's not happening here, and that relates to the trading system. The conspicuous absence of any emphasis on restoring the centrality of the multilateral trading system is something that we are very concerned about. We have proposals to try to do that, but the key um, uh, observation is that countries are going off on their own. They're signing uh, bilateral and regional agreements, but the multilateral system needs reinvigoration. At the back and then here and then I'll move on. Uh, Joachim von Braun. Um, countries which uh, were able to cope with the economic shock had uh, social welfare and social safety nets in place. We need these. Uh, it's not on the list. So social protection, not just the last point, freedom and choice, uh, social protection and social security need to be in place for economic and social welfare. Thank you. And last contribution here. Uh, Laura Liswood. Um, we know some things. Can you just put the microphone up a bit more? Okay. Yeah. Apropos to Mark's uh, comment, uh, that we know some very clear solutions to some of this economic and social welfare. And one of them, which is not up there, is closing the gender gaps. Because we know for sure that'll have some of the kinds of results that we're looking for there. And so I would just like to put in Understood. the gender gap within okay. that. Let's move on, Dan, please, to global risks and systemic failures. Okay, let's pick up quickly on several of those points. Who would like to come in? Uh, from, from my perspective, the last two are, are fascinating, please. But to make a comment on one of the others, the, the, the catastrophic... Which one? The catastrophic risks today, I mean, somebody's been sub-editing what people have sent in. We said uh, chronic disease, which is what this forum has been saying for two years, nuclear, yes, climate change, but also oceans. So I think that the... the catastrophic risks are not, are not correctly uh, listed. Thank you. And water, yeah. Water oh, we're, water. we're doing this at very high speed, so I'm sure it will be there in the final uh, document. Andrew Maynard, just to pick up a bit on the penultimate point there. Very early on in the discussions on our table, the discussions veered towards rethinking and redefining the risk dialogue, and redefining it in terms of uncertainty, unpredictability, and plausibility. Um, and in that context, and it pains me to say this as a, a physicist, but it was very clear that we're going to have to give up on our love affair with numbers, what you might call a cult of quantification, and find other ways of addressing future uncertainty. Anything to put on the table? about in new how to, ways. In how to do that. Well, we actually discussed the need for a collaborative governance, and we, we talked a little bit around that, but nothing concrete. But do you, have a, do you have a clearer idea which you can just put on the table here, given the, the, what you say about numbers, right. of the way that it could be done? Well, I, I think we need global thinking on how we do begin to address uncertainty. The key move here is moving away from talking about risk to talking about uncertainty. Once you've made that move, you can then begin to talk about how you get people together to frame that dialogue and move it away from just talking about numbers, putting numbers on the table, but looking at other factors that influence decisions and addressing uncertainty. But how you do that in a concrete manner, I think, has got to be resolved. Could I ask someone as well to speak about helping people own and internalize risks and how to make that happen? I hope it's been quoted correctly, please. No, but talk about whatever you want on, on this issue. We thought that our uh, key systemic <coughs> suggestion was number two. And while there may be a need to restore the multilateral system for trade, that the climate change breakdown in Copenhagen demonstrated that we can't simply negotiate with 193 countries and that there are issues. The G20 did very well 
with the global economic crisis. We're going to have to have key groups of countries and stakeholders who deal with climate change and other issues. It can be the G20 plus island countries and a representative of the G77, but if we simply stick to the old system of getting 193 countries by consensus, we won't be able to solve any of the systemic risks. Okay, please. Just two words to relate these last two points to what we discussed earlier regarding financial markets and the uh, setting up a fund for ensuring uh, against further financial market uh, breakdowns. That's exactly what's meant with this proposal, to help the financial markets to internalize the risk. And the penultimate point is also <coughs> crucial for financial markets. How do you actually model the uh, possibility, the potential for systemic risk? That nobody did before 2007, and that's why we got into this big trouble. Big trouble. And I think that is where perhaps where natural scientists and others can help financial market risk officers to have a better assessment of the uncertainty they're facing. Right, one more contribution. Can anyone help us on this owning and internalizing risks? Which table did it come from, please? Okay. Dutch okay. Leonard from the Global Risks Group. Uh, yes, we, we will own that phrase. Uh, we we uh, wrote it. The idea is that we believe, uh, similar to the table next to us, that much of the risk communication that we do is confusing to the society in general, and that as a result, people don't have the right stance and the right degree of strategic uh, foresight about how they might uh, deal with risks in advance. Uh, so the challenge is to try to develop a better risk dialogue with the public that will make it more aware of and better able to uh, prepare for in advance uh, and in advance of, of actually the onset of, of uh, risks and hazards. And do you think human nature can cope with that? Uh, we are up against the problem that human nature is one of our other points. Humans, human beings and human institutions are not very well designed to do this. So we've got a lot of mechanism designed to undertake to improve that. But I think that's, that's the spirit of both these two tables back here. Great. Thank you. Please, over here. Um, yes, I'm Musa. I'm a global change maker from Iraq. I'm 17 years old. And frankly, I think these statements are great. And they're just statements, though. We're, what we're doing is we're giving statements, but we're not giving concrete solutions we're not doing we're not saying we'll do workshops to do this we're not we're just saying how to do it and putting a topic instead of actually working on the ground instead of actually working with the communities we're not going and working with people we're just making statements well, and unless we can make one workshop or one or thing or project that we can actually work on i think this will be useless and we'll talk about the same subject next year all right let's hear that from the rapporteurs at the end but we are identifying things here. I'm going to take two more contributions, then we have two more groups, but one of them only has one con contribution, please. Yes, um, I wanted to include, we included in this table one phrase that is formalize the inclusion of climate change in the deliberations and commitments of the G20, following the gentleman. Thank you. Uh, one here and one there. I'm going to expand a little bit. Uh, one here, please, okay. and over there. Uh, Shirley Jackson, uh, U.S. I want to talk about the uh, last, the last two uh, uh, bullets here. I think I'm going to repeat something I said last year. People talk a lot about systemic risk. The real way you have to get at risk is to understand derivative risks and intersecting risks, because it's not a, usually a simple thing. And so one way you build new decision models is to do scenario-based risk assessment and planning against those. That is also how you get people to internalize risk and be prepared to deal with them. Thank you very much indeed. Two more contributions and then I will move on. One here, one here, please. Uh, Rafael Ramirez from the Strategic Foresight GAC. Uh, we are in the second to last comment and addressing the point about Iraq. I was uh, earlier in the um, forum here uh, facilitating a session on three different framings of the future of metals and mining. And as opposed to the process that we're doing here, the process which is also part of the World Economic Forum was to create three contrasting, totally different and incompatible framings of the same situation. And that moves us from risk to uncertainty. And so the, uh, the, the next step of which the Iraqi question uh, uh, rose, which is correct, is what kind of bold experiments would you then need to do? And you ideally want to 
launch 9 to, to 12 bold experiments because some of them will fail and the experiments have to be across scales. Right, thank you. Please, last I, comment. I think, uh, Peter Anderson, I think internalizing risk is also about helping promote resilience amongst people through investing in good health, good education, and the ability to make good choices. Thank you. Uh, again, I apologize for the speed at which I'm pushing this along, but you know the time uh, constraints. Let's get the uh, security area, Dan, please. The need to consolidate the shift from state to human security from competitive to co cooperative security, and the need to strengthen and evolve institutions to manage global change. The ta where's the security table? Who would like to just underscore that? Gareth? Well, you had your arms sh folded. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm the skeptic about a lot of this sort of... I'm the skeptic about a lot of this stuff, but you do need big framing ideas as a precondition for developing policy strategies in detail on the ground. And the three big framing ideas that came out of our discussion here, first of all, the need to consolidate this shift from state to human security. Human security is an all-embracing concept, but it's a very important counterweight to the traditional focus just on, on state chest beating. Individuals are involved and issues of dealing with um, mass atrocity crimes and so on do demand a, a perception of that kind. And we're, we're doing that, but we need to go further. Um, similarly, in terms of the, the major things we're familiar with about intergovernmental rivalries, tectonic plates, power shifts. We do have to get away from the notion that states are all about uh, building armed forces, uh, that life is about competition which has military risk at its core, and develop a much more uh, cooperative approach to resolving security problems. This has been articulated very well going all the way back to Olaf Palmer, common security, you build your security with others rather than against them. But it's highly relevant to contemporary issues like what do you do about the uh, the NATO-Russia sort of relationship. Do you think of this as an inevitably uh, condemned to be competitive or is there a way of reconceptualizing that in terms of you know, bringing Russia into NATO and thinking completely differently about what uh, can be done in that context? Similarly with a lot of other regional uh, security organizations that we're trying to evolve in different parts of the state. And the third thing is the need to translate those big uh, conceptual framing ideas into effective institutional change, not only at the intergovernmental global level, but the regional level and national level as well. So they're the, they're the three core ideas there, but they need a lot of filling out, otherwise they just wind. Thanks, Gareth. Let's move on there. We're talking about effective institutions underpinning the previous five areas. So can I just move on, Vijay, please, to effective institutions, because there is a, a convergence. And in the last five minutes before we uh, hear from uh, three of the rapporteurs or those reflecting, can I ask you to reflect on these uh, six bullets? Anyone want to put, pick up, particularly on the last two points? Yes. In the values section, we talked about the need for leadership. And here we're back to governance. And it seems to me very significant that when we talk about effective institutions, we're prepared to abdicate the moral responsibility for corporate and personal leadership and put it back into a sort of political science problem. So I think here we should talk about more focused leadership, which is also an issue for what the forum agenda should be. Global governance siloed, issues interlinked horizontally and vertically. Anyone want to add to that, please? Thank you. Thank you. Vijay Panasamy from Etihad Airways in Abu Dhabi. Our table focus on effective institutions, essentially, recognizing as we try to reach for the, our goal, which is sustainable and inclusive growth, we need to deal with the global challenges. And the only effective way of dealing with those would be through governments. Uh, we should not underestimate the capacity of governments to succeed or to fail in taking us to our goal. So what we are asking is for governments to actually come together, not to resolve global issues, but to come together to look at the way in which they work to resolve global issues. If governments can come together and re-engineer the way they work to be able to deliver on the promises to the people, that would be a good start. So a, a global meeting 
for, by government to look at the way they work. Thank you. Please. Yeah. Do get the microphone quickly, can you? And here as well. Yes, thank you. In our table, we said something about governance of the multilateral development institutions. And this is based on, on serious work that has found that these institutions have very serious problems of governance. So we want them, or we want governments, the partner, the members of these institutions, to make them accountable, to eliminate conflict of interest in their governance. All of them are affected by serious problems of conflict of interest and by enhancing the voice of representation of emerging or developing countries because today more than 50% of GDP is produced by emerging countries and this is not reflected in the government and governance of these institutions. Thank you, please. Uh, looking at, uh, I'm, I'm a rabbi from I'm sitting at the table, economic and social welfare, because I believe we, the interaction is so important. I want to address myself to Musa, because uh, Musa, the change maker, uh, made, made a, of course, a very valid point that uh, if institutions are about institutions and not about people, they will not be legitimate or efficient. And I would like to think that with I so much strengthened by the value that have penetrated all that we are in the same boat, that by the end of this year, because this is a crucial year, at the end of the year, there will be an agreement or there will not be agreement about not only climate change, but the poverty eradication with the Millennium Development Goals, that we try to translate this into the classroom in an action and that we ask ourselves, what by the end of the year is an act of compassion that we have committed ourselves or we have done which we have not done previously and which has changed us this year i hope that that report at the end of the year will the proof of what we have done here has been really effective thank you please yeah george martins from consumers international uh, the first thing about behavioral change making it simple uh, I think if you look at what has in the past uh, brought about uh, people's change in behavior, I think the seatbelt is a very powerful example. Shouldn't we be looking for what is the sustainability seatbelt and have that as a metaphor to, 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 to work on this? Right. I'll take two more interventions quickly, then we're going to wrap up. One here, please, and one here. Hermenia Ibarra from the Gender Gap Council. I just wanted to say, especially looking at these bullets, that across the different takeaways, there seem to be two fundamentally opposed views of human nature that are coming out and how people are framing the problems. One is, we're fundamentally not equipped to make the right choices. That's just human nature. We make the bad choices on the short-term basis for the long-term future we want, and therefore we have to force, we have to nudge, we have to govern. It's a much more top-down solution. And then some of the other comments had a much more good wins out kind of perspective on human nature. If we just let people share, if we just let people be empowered, we will come to an emergent good solution. Right. And just an observation. Very pragmatic. Last observation before I go to the three rapporteurs. Yeah, a very practical one, Bruno Lanvin from the uh, GAC on Future of Government. Uh, we've seen many heads of international organizations participating in Davos this year. And there was a lot of goodwill. Uh, at the same time, if we look at the, uh, the bullet point about institutions should not be about institutions but about people, we should encourage those organizations, and I believe this is a signal that can come from Davos, in defining their mission in less than five words. If they can put a mission statement in less than five words, there will be a much higher degree of readability of what these organizations are around the world. Thank you. I want to capture impressions, not quite in five words, but in no more than a minute from Ashraf Ghani, David Kennedy, and Simon Maxwell. Ashraf, your impression from the last 90 minutes. The three critical phrases, rethink our inherited 20th century institutions, move to redesign because the design of the rules of governance of both the market and the state needs revisiting, and to rebuild based on networks, new forms of collaboration, new mechanisms of power mobilization that are based on collective power rather than redistributive. The risks are immense. We need to move from a risk environment to an uncertainty environment.
because uncertainty is inherently about scenarios and ways of responding. Last issue. There is a lot of complaining from governments about the market and from markets about the government. And from last year to this year, we have not made marked progress. Next year's Davos should have very concrete proposals as how to bring new rules of governance to govern globalization. David Kennedy. Thanks very much. Uh, listening to this conversation and also reflecting on the week, a uh, couple of thoughts about where we are and a couple of thoughts about the ways forward. I think on where we are, what I hear is a sense of continued interdependence and mutual vulnerability, a sense that if problems aren't as acute as they may have seemed last year, the dangers are just as great, maybe greater, uh, and uh, that we have not yet metabolized the social and political consequences of the crisis, risks that are at a tipping point, uh, and so forth. Uh, and secondly, that the dangers seem daunting, particularly daunting because we're experiencing them at a time of great change and uncertainty where we don't understand how the structural, geopolitical, and uh, internal changes to industries and so forth will f shake out in the coming period. Uh, a sense of loss of leadership and a sense that the economic world has drifted apart from the political world in which it was once embedded. So it's difficult for the economic world and market to find its place of stability and difficult for the political world to address the policy challenges that come with the global economy. So ways forward, I've heard three clusters of ideas both this morning and over the last week. First, whether after Copenhagen or in other ways, a focus on variable geometry, plural solutions, uh, initiatives by particular key stakeholders, public and private, local city sometimes as key agents of change at the global level, uh, that we move away from the gold standard of universal rules uh, universally arrived at in the direction of a game played on many more boards than we're used to. Secondly, a search across many different areas for new metrics and new measures, uh, which speaks to me first of a feeling of a gap in knowledge, either that knowledge is not being collected in the right way, that we don't understand the right things, knowledge is not distributed properly, there are blind spots in the way in which we understand the problems, but I think the search for metrics and the discussion of measures also expresses a worry about values uh, and the difficulty of integrating into our numeric measures and our statistical uh, operations a variety of other things we, we find crucial to solving these problems. And finally, uh, a sense that the change that will be needed requires some kind of institutional reboot, that an energized politics always needs an institutional form to be effective, and the search for that institutional form to actually move from talking to doing uh, is, is something which we've all been looking around for all week. The one thing I would say about that, I'm left on a very optimistic note, is the sense in which the entire GRI and GAC process has been both one of trying to diagnose problems and one of trying to aim for very specific actionable solutions. And I'll be looking forward over the coming months to see how some of the very detailed proposals that have come out of the workshops here uh, move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Uh, I should remind you that Alicia here has been capturing everything silently on the white boards. Um, so there will be that. And there will also be everything posted on welcome as well to continue the discussion. Simon, uh, four days ago, you talked about the four lacks, L-A-C-K-S. What have we achieved or not in the last four days? I think three words have driven our discussion this week. They are simple words. They are why and what and how. On why, we've learned that the risks we face are global and systemic. But we've also heard that our response to those risks must be value-driven. Remember that the word in largest letters on the chart we did on Wednesday was rights and justice. And those values need to drive everything we do. We've heard a lot today about equity and uh, human security. Benjamin Franklin said it right. He said, you know what, we hang together or assuredly we hang separately. What? We've got a growing consensus around what needs to be done in poverty, in education, in health, in social protection, security, trade, climate, gender, 
creating the new resilience. But the most important takeaway for me has been that this must be a virtuous spiral and not a downward spiral. We don't want these global risks to become the bogeymen of our consciousness and our policy making. We need to find ways in which we inspire people to do things differently in a virtuous cycle. Finally, how? It's easy to talk in big global issues. I think Mark Malik Brown and Gareth Evans have both made the important point that we need global goals and global guidance and then personal pathways. And one of the most inspiring lessons for me from this Davos has been the number of concrete practical initiatives that are being taken by business leaders and agencies. Those are the ones we need to build on. Finally, a personal PS. I want to congratulate the forum for what it's done. I think this is going to change the world. I'd like to start a campaign today that Klaus and the Forum should receive a Nobel Prize for what they do. Simon, thank you very much. We've run over by five minutes, but that's because of the richness of discussion. I'm sorry if there were three or four of you who I couldn't recognize, but thanks for your patience. Your personal pathway should now take you to Sanada, uh, which is where uh, Klaus Schwab will chair the closing session. Thank you all very much indeed.